And it's our desire that you would have a copy of the Word of God because we want to know uh, what God says, not what man says. Man, when we preach the Word of God, we can boldly say, Thus saith the Lord. This is what God says. And we can have full confidence of it. But we have that confidence because of this book. This book which was given to us by inspiration of God. And it's a perfect book that God gave without error. And it's a preserved book. It's a book that uh, God didn't have a reason to give without error and then have it be lost. Uh, the translators of the Bible that we use believed and knew that the Scripture was God's perfect Word. Uh, Brother uh, Luke, yes, we, if you need a copy of... The, oh, no, you don't need to worry about that. I, well, I don't know if you need to worry about that or not. Uh, he's asking me if he should turn out the lights. I can get them if we, do, if we need to. Does everybody have a copy of the handout from today? There's a, there's a handout for the service this morning. If you need a copy, just put your hand up and Luke will make sure to get you one. He's got uh, plenty of those available for you with all the errors that we'll find as we go through them here this morning. You won't need that right away. That's a copy of the, of the outline uh, that we'll just be looking at, or just, just some of the highlights of the, of the things that we'll be looking at in Revelation chapter 7 uh, here this morning. But uh, I do want to uh, preach the Word of God in, in the Scripture this morning. And the topic that we're dealing with uh, is very, very timely in the sense that there is a great deal of error being preached in churches that ought to know better, to be frank, and by people that ought to have a better understanding of the Scripture today. And so a lot of what we're going to cover before we really get into our text here this morning, a lot of it is just going to be information that answers questions that probably a lot of you have. Uh, I don't know how many of you this would be true of, but uh, online preaching is pretty popular right now, isn't it? And the place where most people go now is YouTube. And uh, <laughs> there's a lot of good stuff on YouTube. You can pretty much learn how to do anything or fix anything. Or just it, YouTube can be a real help. And uh, but there are a lot of uh, nuts on YouTube too. Anyone can post anything on YouTube uh, without credential, without validation. Anyone here a professional at anything? You ever have somebody that's a hack in your trade? I, you know, I used to be a certified, ASE certified automotive technician when I was in college. And I saw a lot of hacking on cars. My wife and I were talking about the medical profession this week. And we were talking about dentists in particular. And, uh, you know, I told her, I said, you know, I wouldn't want to go to just any mechanic. Matter of fact, most mechanics, I wouldn't want to work on my car. Because of what they do to the car. I said, I sure wouldn't let anybody touch my teeth. Unless... <laughs> Uh, they're the best because and let me just give you some some practical personal advice don't go to the dentist they'll mess up your teeth don't get cavities and uh, don't have tooth problems and you'll be way better off than if you let the dentist grind your teeth down and ruin them and then end up after they ruin them doing a root canal and then tearing them out and putting in a post and all that they, it, it just it's it's the end to never-ending heartache when you go to the dentist so just trust me I don't go and it's worked out very well for me and so just follow my advice <laughs> and don't go to the dentist. Okay, don't brush your teeth too much either. That's really hard on them. And so only, you know, only when they need it. So be careful. <laughs> All right. Uh, some of that I'm kidding about. Most of that, most of that I'm, I'm kidding about. My wife could tell you which parts are true and which aren't. So, <laughs> uh, but seriously... There's a lot of preaching on YouTube by people that are novices uh, with the Word of God. Or they have, like all of us do, they have presuppositions or predispositions towards certain things. I mean, I'll tell you, the conspiracies today are stronger than ever before, aren't they? I mean, there are just more conspiracies out there. Are there real conspiracies? Are actually evil people in secret places doing evil things? Yes, there are. Let me just offer you some help with all that in life in general. The good thing about conspirators is that they have their own agenda. And the wonderful thing about that is each of them have their own agenda. And so because each of them have their own agenda, their agendas are exclusive of one another. If the conspirators in the world could all get the same agenda and get together, as one day they will, we'd have something to worry about. But right now they all just counteract each other. And one group wants to supplant the other group and so forth. Don't waste your time worrying about evil. God's got that handled very well. He knows about things that are secrets to you. And He's not 
He's not threatened or concerned or worried. The gospel's the big thing right now. Uh, the gospel is what God is doing, and it has the power to save whoever calls on the name of the Lord. And that's our business. You don't need to find out what's going on behind closed doors or what you think is going on because you're probably wrong about most of it. Most of what people think is happening actually isn't. I don't know how many times in the church people have come and said, Pastor, you know what's going on with that person? And they tell me something they think that's going on with somebody. And I think, I know what's going on with them, and you don't know. What you think is, yeah, had somebody think something about you? Yeah. And it just wasn't true? You know, it takes a lot of audacity, doesn't it? To think that you know something because you watched a video about somebody uh, saying what they know and, and you know, just, just, just use wisdom as a believer. But the same thing has trickled in the same folks, I would say, that would buy into the conspiracies and be worried about secret governments and secret things. They also dabble in theology. And I'll tell you a common thread of the conspiracists and the, the individuals who teach false doctrine is anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. You hear me this morning, you listen to me carefully. A common thread or a common conclusion of conspiracy nuts and the same kind of individuals in the church is anti-Semitism, and it is very, very pervasive. It's very real, and God hates it. And God will judge us for participating. And let me just uh, share some things with you this morning for qualification so you don't instantly veer off and say, oh, pastor, I don't agree with where you're going with this this morning. Let me just share a couple of things. First of all, salvation is, has been, and always will be by faith. Being of the ethnicity of national Israel does not make you a believer in God or Jesus. Do everybody understand that? How many of you know Jews that don't believe in God? Do you? How many of you know Jews that don't believe Jesus is the Messiah? Where did the first church begin? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Was it made up of Gentiles? No. no. They, they were saved Jews, weren't they? Uh, Christians, first of all, I've, I've been bothered for years by ministries that focus on Jews. And I don't mind ministries trying to reach lost, lost Israel. I don't mind that at all. I, that, that's wonderful. It ought to happen. But when they preach the gospel differently to the Jews, there's a little bit of a problem. You know, a Jew that... Uh, rejects the New Testament, also probably rejects the Old Testament of the Scripture. I've just found that those things are common threads. And so if you throw away the New Testament and the uh, and really the light that it sheds on the Old Testament, you've just kind of cut half the Word of God out from under yourself along with the authority of it. And so let me just say, state unequivocally without qualification this morning that you have to be born again in order to be saved. Now we'll see uh, Scripture that deals with that with more clarity. But I just don't want you to take off. Say, oh, pastor's saying national Israel are God's chosen people and they're all God's people today. No, what I'm saying is that God has a plan. God has a plan for national Israel, even though today they're in unbelief. And I'm talking about unbelieving Israel. Mm -hmm. Believing Israel's part of the church. That's where the church got started, right? The church, my friend, was a new concept in the first century and it was known... Uh, by the Jews and Gentiles as a sect of Judaism until the Gentiles got saved in such great numbers, specifically at Antioch, that the believers began to be called Christians. Their identity became more with Jesus than with Judaism. You understand that this morning? Let me say a second thing this morning by way of qualification. Judaism as is practiced primarily today, matter of fact, let me, just, not, let me not just say primarily, exclusively, Judaism as practiced today is not the worship that God prescribes in His law for Israel. Is not so? There are a couple of important elements missing in the worship of is with Israel today. The first of which is a temple, a Levitical priesthood, sacrifices, the sacrificial system, and you know the replacement of that with Judaism today with uh, the cleansing waters and the different things that are substitutes are not endorsed by the Scripture. And God never accepts anyone coming to Him as they perceive Him. Remember what Jesus told the woman, the Samaritan woman at the well, when she said, our, you know, the Jews say we have to worship at Jerusalem at the temple, but our fathers worship here in this mountain. What did Jesus say? He said, God is a spirit, and they that worship Him, yeah, it's true, God's in the mountain, but when you worship Him, you have to worship Him in spirit and in truth. And the truth is, is that he said, worship me in Jerusalem at the temple. He doesn't have worship in high places. And so truth 
is what's involved. And so, like any false religion, when there is an intermixture of truth, uh, it doesn't matter how much truth you mix in, if it isn't God's way, God doesn't accept it. Do you understand that? What's God's way for eternal life? Salvation is by faith in Jesus Christ. And it always has been. There are individuals that are all over the spectrum with regard to God's plan and God's past with Israel and the church. So uh, today, I want to begin by asking the question and answering before we get it. Well, let's begin by reading our text this morning so you can kind of see uh, what, what evokes the question or uh, helps where I see the need to cover what we're going to cover first. Let's go to chapter 7 of verse... Our chapter 7 of Revelation, let's just read down until we come to verse 10. After these things, notice the word after, that follows the chronology of Revelation, uh, and we'll see that in a little while. After these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice and to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed, and hundred and forty-four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel." Of the tribe of Judah were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Reuben were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Gad were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Asher were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Nephthalim were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Manassas were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Simeon were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Levi were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Issachar were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Zebulun were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Joseph were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed 12,000. After this I behold, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. And I always break off into Handel's Messiah in my head here, but we can't go there this morning. Let's go ahead. And let's take this to the Lord and ask His help today. Father, please help us to understand the Scripture and to apply it as written, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Salvation unto... <laughs> it starts going through my head. Handel's Messiah. By the way, I love Handel's Messiah. I don't really see it so much as a Christmas, uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a masterpiece and I enjoy it. Um, Israel and the church. The popular teaching today is replacement theology, and it's not exactly the same as Presbyterian theology, although it's similar, not exactly the same as covenant theology, although it is similar, which says that the church of today is, has replaced Israel. In other words, the covenant promises to Israel are fulfilled in the local church. But today there are individuals who call themselves Baptist. Now Baptist is not denominational, if you know what Baptist means. Baptist is doctrinal. Baptists believe the Baptist distinctives. Bible authority, autonomy, priesthood of believers. Uh, we believe in, in the uh, two ordinances, the Lord's Supper, uh, baptism and uh, the Lord's Supper. We believe in uh, saved, or uh, uh, I'm sorry, we believe in the doctrine of the Trinity or the Godhead. We believe in individual atonement. We believe in saved church membership. And uh, I, I messed up by mixing the Trinity and, and uh, the, the uh, Trinity's last one. The uh, first one is the two ordinances. But... Uh, the, the reality of it is, is that a Baptist, you could believe all those things and you could remove the title Baptist, but if you believe those things, you're what would have been called a Baptist by people who weren't Baptist. Uh, you'd be a person who believes that you get saved and then you get baptized by immersion and those who had been part of the established church would have, uh, would have sneered and mocked you and called you Baptist and you, you would be what you are. It's just sort of, uh, it, it just, it's just like calling somebody anything that you are. I can say to Charlie, man, you're a man. And uh, I can say it like it's a term of derision, but he can say, yeah, I'm a man. You know? I could say, you're an American. And I could say it like it's a term of derision, but he's an American man. You can call somebody what they are, and that's what a Baptist is. 
So you may say, I'm non-denominational. Well, that's what autonomous means, actually. Autonomous means that you're not affiliated. Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church has church plants. We start a Marathon Baptist Church, but now they're independent of us. They're autonomous. We don't make any decisions with them. Uh, we don't have anything. We were friends. You know, if we can help, we want to help them. But uh, they're independent of us. I can't call Pastor Nick and say, you know, tomorrow I want you to preach this message in your church. And I think that your church needs to go this direction. No, I don't have the authority to do that. They're autonomous. Um, we, we have a church that's a ministry of Fort Lauderdale Baptist, Miami Beach Baptist Church. And they're not so autonomous right now because they don't have their own pastor and leadership. And the membership is largely comprised with a lot of us that go down and worship there and worship with a few there. They're not quite autonomous yet, but when they're an established ministry, they'll be autonomous. They, they'll, uh, I, I haven't taken on missions or uh, really developed a philosophy and a plan for the type of a church. I, I believe they're going to have a great addictions ministry in Miami Beach just on the basis of the kind of people that we're reaching right now. But I haven't begun any of that or really done a lot of that because it's not going to be my church. I'm not going to be pastoring in that church someday. I want them to be autonomous. And the new pastor, uh, the pastor that comes there, needs to be able to lead that ministry uh, with the Word of God, with the, the help of the priesthood of the believers and the leading of the Holy Spirit. And so that's what we are as a church. But the, the tra traditionally, uh, Baptists have been called Baptists by people who are part of the organized church or people... Uh, who have rejected particular things about the organized church. And we would call them reformers. They'd be individuals that tried to fix Catholicism. They wanted to reform or repair the problems with Catholicism. We know the names of a great deal of reformers, but there are names of many reformers who we do not know. Uh, the point of it is, though, the difference between what we would be as a church and what Baptists traditionally would be versus that would be uh, that Baptists have never thought that you could fix Catholicism. Baptists have always just believed that the church is acts. It's a church described in acts. It's comprised only with believers. The organization is not the church. Individuals who are saved make up the church. They comprise the church. And in a local body, saved individuals comprise a local church. And so we've never recognized the overall institution of Catholicism. And so... Uh, protest. I'm, I'm glad if an individual recognizes that Mary should not be prayed to, the saints ought not to be venerated, that the priests uh, don't have to be a go-between between between us and God, uh, that, uh, and you could go down a list of grievances and uh, doctrinal heresies of Catholicism, but the major doctrinal heresy or error of Catholicism is that it's an organization that claims to represent God. An organization does not represent God. Saved people become Christ's bride or Christ's church. They make up the body of Christ. And so that organization from its institution, when the uh, disciples of origin from, and the Alexandrians uh, connived or conspired with Constantine to begin an, a, a Roman church, and when everybody in the, in the country of Rome was declared to be Christian and now part of the church, that isn't how you become a believer. That's not how you become a Christian. You get to be a believer by receiving Jesus as your Savior. So the institution has never been valid. You say, Pastor, is everyone in, in the Catholic Church lost? Well, God knows the answer to that question. I do not. Any person who's received Jesus as their Savior is born again. And you can be on the rolls of any organization, and that does not validate or invalidate you. God is the judge in the answer of that question. Uh, could a person hear the, the gospel in Catholicism? Well, they read the Bible sometimes, don't they? Yeah, so, so the answer? Yes, they could. Could there be saved people? Yes. I'm confused about it because I don't know the hearts of a person. I don't know how much you accept, how much you reject. But so, so I'm not making blanket statements. I'm not, I'm not uh, bashing here today. I'm just simply just telling you that, that we're not Catholic and we're not Reformed because we're not coming out of Catholicism. That's the point. In other words, the church doesn't come out of Catholicism. We're not trying to reform anything. The Reformers got kicked out of Catholicism. If the Reformers today, if Reformed churches, could accomplish what they wish, they would fix the problems of Catholicism, go back into it, because they believe that the Catholic Church is the true church. I do not, do you? Never has been. So that would be a distinction. That would be a difference. Reformed theology, though, replaces, and Catholic theology replaces the church, or replaces Israel with the church. 
And if you study carefully the New Testament of the Scripture, or you just study it as exactly as it's written, uh, we know that the New Covenant, the New Testament, the New Covenant that God was going to make, uh, did not abolish all of the Old Covenant. God didn't get rid of Israel. God's divorced Israel according to Malachi. According to Daniel chapter 9, uh, there's going to be a week that's left before God restores Jerusalem and restores the kingdom of Israel. And that week is where we're at in the Revelation right now. That's the seven years of what we call the tribulation. Now there are a lot of um, ignorant statements about tribulation that are popular on YouTube today. And let me just, just, just say it this way. Uh, and it's, it's about words. And I'll be honest with you. I'll be frank with you. And I'm going to be a little bit, I'm going to be bashing just a little bit here because uh, I think it's appropriate to do so at certain times. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is that they are founded and propagated in ignorance. Individuals will take the word tribulation and put tribulation in every context. There's tribulation for the saints, isn't there not? Is there such thing as believers in Christ Jesus suffering persecution? Let's, let me help you to understand something. What we're looking at in Revelation right now is that the heavens are rolled back like a scroll. God in heaven is visible on earth. And these four angels that are about to hurt the earth and hurt the sea and hurt the waters, these individuals that are about to destroy the earth are doing so with God in heaven visible to every man on the earth. The men on earth have said, to, they've crawled in caves and said to the rocks, fall on us! Because they're afraid of the wrath of God, but before they would bow to God, and before they would acknowledge Him as God, they had rather die. And friend, that's not something new. That's the way it's always been. There have always been individuals that rather than do it God's way, they'd rather die. Cain would rather die. He'd rather kill his brother Abel than offer the sacrifice that God wants. Remember God's response to Cain? If thou doest well, why, why don't you just offer what I asked? You know, the notion that Cain could not offer the right sacrifice to God is ridiculous. He very easily could have offered the same sacrifice as Abel. He could have traded Abel, his, his uh, fruits, for a lamb. He could have offered a lamb. That's what God required, but he wanted to come to God his way, and God rejected it, and Cain, rather than bow, just killed Abel. You know, that's mankind's response to God many times. It's, God, before I bow, I, I die! before I bow to you. That's why it's important when we worship God to bow. There is something about the humility that it takes to bow before God in heaven that just rights us. It puts us in our place and puts God in His. Now He's already there, but in our minds we get all out of sorts sometimes. Okay, so that statement about the tribulation, you know, that's, that makes tribulation at the hand of man the equivalent of tribulation at the hand of God, my friend, there's a big difference. Listen, the, the Bible tells us not to fear what a man can do to us, right? But we're supposed to be afraid of what God can do to us. And that's what we're seeing in Revelation. That's where we're at in chapter 7. We're right in the midst of these seven seal judgments that Daniel was told in, in Daniel 12 to seal up until the time. And now we see this is a future event that's going to take place when literally God is going to start judging the world judging the wicked. And so these are the events that take place. So I want to ask the question, the answer the question. Uh, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. I wanted to find just a couple more words. Here's some more nonsense that is, that is spewed forth. I, I would accept the statement and endorse the statement that Judaism of today is not the worship of God which is prescribed for Israel in the law. Would everybody here agree with that? Mm -hmm. Judaism as practiced today is not the worship of God that was prescribed for national Israel through the tabernacle and temple systems. That's true, isn't it? Yeah. <clears throat> there are individuals that would take the word synagogue and create a teaching that the word synagogue is a Jewish word and it's a Jewish concept. And so synagogues uh, are the synagogue of Satan. Every time there's a synagogue, it's the synagogue of Satan. I wonder why Jesus went to those, by the way. Uh, when he was on earth. The reality of it, the word synagogue, they say is a, is a Jewish word. No, it's not. The word synagogue, for those that are so ignorant that they don't know what the word means, the word synagogue means uh, gathering. We see the use of the word in Hebrews 10.25 when the Bible says we're not to forsake uh, the gathering of ourselves together as the manner of some is. 
The word synagogue is just a gathering place. And it's a Greek word, not a Jewish word, not a Hebrew word, and some nonsensical false doctrine. If you haven't heard of it, don't waste your time learning what the false teaching about it is. But I'm just addressing it in case you've heard that argument, uh, using synagogue as, uh, you know, God hates the Jews and God's replaced Israel with the church, and every synagogue is a synagogue of Satan. Synagogue's a gathering place. And in that sense, this is a synagogue here today, though it's not a public uh, not just a public meeting place like a synagogue in Christ's day perhaps would have been. You know another another Greek word that would be similar to synagogue? Ecclesia. And the same individuals that spew the nonsense about synagogues don't bash on the ecclesia. And so what I'm saying is that's an invalid argument. Okay, It's, it's made out of ignorance and it's sad that the education of the individuals is... Uh, just an education of bias. In other words, they hate Jews, they hate Israel, and they're conspiracists, and so they try to build doctrines that attack a people that God has a future purpose and plan for, and is built out of hatred and animosity, and while they would make the claims that while they would scream rhetoric that is intolerable, that they're not racist and that, uh, that uh, you know, that they are fine, you know, Jews are just regular people, and uh, they can be saved like anyone else. Their words contradict uh, their other words. They contradict themselves. And the source of it is hatred. All right, so I want to ask the question today, is Israel uh, in the past, uh, and the, is, is Israel, does it have a future purpose, or is it merely a relic of the past? That's the question. In the Revelation, when we read these events that describe, like in our text today, 12,000 from, from each of the 12 tribes, numbering 144,000, are they actually Jewish? Or are there no more Jews? Well, yes, the answer is yes, and it seems common sense. Uh, let's let's co cover some things, okay? So, let's talk about Israel in the past. In the past, Israel in the past is presented to us in Genesis. Now, any person who's going to try to figure out what the church is and the phenomenon of the church and uh, figure out what Israel is and the difference between the two and ask the question, is there a future plan for Israel? You've got to read the entirety of Genesis and just outline it, practically speaking. Now, I'm asking you to do that, but I'm not, I'm not going to try to do that with you here this morning, but I'll give you, I'm asking you to do that, and I'm going to give you the results that you'd find if you were to study Genesis. Genesis is origins. It tells us where everything came from. It begins by telling us where we came from and where the, where the earth came from, right? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Then we see that God created man. Following that, we see where sin came from. Sin came from the fall of man, his choice, his decision uh, to sin. And then we see the origin of the moment that man sinned, Genesis 3.15, that God gave us a plan uh, to redeem us. And so in Genesis 3.15, when God said that he was going to bruise the serpent's head, we see that there was a plan that God had to redeem man to himself. Following that, if you trace Genesis, you'll see two lines. You'll see the line, it would have been Cain, or it would have been Abel, but Abel was killed by Cain. You'll see the line of Cain, and you'll see the line of Seth. Cain would have been the unbelieving line, Seth, and his descendants would have been believers. You'll see those lines diverge, be completely separate lines until you come to the, before the days of Noah, and that's when you'll see the sons of God and uh, the daughters of men, married the daughters of men. And gene genealogy, or the genealogy shows uh, that Seth's line marries into Cain's line, and righteousness does not influence evil. Evil affects righteousness, and things were so wicked on the earth that there was only one just man, Noah. And God destroyed the earth. And then you see again Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And you see a godly line. Uh, you really see all three of those sons having some individuals that were believers. You follow the genealogies. But then you see uh, that there is a man who uh, has, who's by the name of Abraham. And you see uh, that he really separates himself from uh, not just his father, his father had separated himself, but he leaves his father's house and he goes into a land that God would show him. And so uh, a simple study of Genesis as you go through it brings us through an introduction to Abraham and the covenant promises that God made to Abraham. It goes, brings you through Isaac and where God reiterates those promises through Isaac and rejects Ishmael. And you see Jacob, where Jacob literally supplants his older brother Esau and desires that blessing, which has to do with God's covenant promises 
that he's going to not only provide a redeemer, but now with Abraham, uh, you see that there are promises that involve more uh, than just a messianic promise, some future plans for Israel uh, that have to do with kingdom. Uh, so a, a simple study of Genesis brings us to the conclusion that the seed of a woman will be revealed as part of the covenants that God made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Later on, you'll see a man by the name of King David, whom God makes some promises. We call those the Davidic covenant. And of course, I know there are other covenants. God made a covenant with Noah. God made a covenant with Moses and with the children of Israel. Many covenants that I'm not covering here today. But a covenant theologian today would say that the covenants that God made with these individuals and their descendants, which involved land as well as spiritual promises, and some of which were conditional and some which were not conditional, David, the Davidic covenant was, did not have conditions to it. But some individuals will say that the church has now received those promises. Those promises are to the church instead of Israel. And my friend, that's wicked, and uh, it, it's nonsensical. Uh, Genesis chapter 15, and again, this PowerPoint will be available hopefully in a more complete format. Uh, Genesis chapter 15 is the Abrahamic covenant. He said unto Abraham, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that's not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And then verse 14, Also that nation whom they shall serve will judge, and afterward shall they come out with great substance, and thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, but shall be buried in good old age. Uh, but in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not full out of course as a covenant about the land of Egypt. Um, that, that covenant was reaffirmed with Isaac, the Abrahamic covenant. Again, this, this is not everything the Bible has to say about these covenants. I'm just reading some things to you. I'm sorry if I'm boring you right now, but this, where we're going with this is important uh, to, to getting there. And I hope that you'll just stay tuned and pay as much attention uh -oh, as you possibly can. Uh, in Genesis chapter, let's see. Um, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the Abrahamic covenant was also confirmed with Isaac. And we see the Lord appear to him the same night and said, I am the God of thy father. Fear not, for I am with thee and will bless thee and multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. That's Genesis 26, 24. And so it was reaffirmed with Isaac. And then it was reaffirmed with Jacob. Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. He lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. He took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven, and behold, uh, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. So Jacob had this experience with God. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father, and the God of Isaac, the land whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to their seed. Now let me pause here and give you a little caveat. There is a popular teaching today that Israel fully inhabited the land that God promised them. And that's never been the case. There's one verse in the scripture where God talks about the way, the manner in which he gave the land to Israel. Like he just completely gave it to them. And it's the manner in which God offered it, not the scope in which it was occupied. It's never been fully occupied ever in history, in the history of the world. And that's a future event that's going to be fulfilled. Uh, and I see shall be as the dust of the earth, thou shalt spread abroad to the east and the west and the north and the south, and in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. We could pause there and say, it has always been God's intention not to exclusively redeem Israel at the loss of the other nations of the earth, but it's always been God's plan to use Israel uh, so that the nations of the earth can have access to God. And that's a wonderful thing. Uh, Behold, I am with thee and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest and will bring thee again unto this land for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to the uh, that's to Jacob. Now let's have a little excursus or a little bit of an excursion. Uh, the promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob each involve, number one, seed. Seed is children. Number two, land. The land which God had Abraham transverse the borders of. And number three, it was an everlasting covenant. If you were to read Genesis 17, 13, you see it's not a covenant that ends. The argument by the anti-Semite preachers of today would be that the land which the Jews are occupying today, the Zionists, that that land does not belong to them specifically. It belongs more to the Arabs because genetically the Arabs are more uh, descendants of Abraham than many of them are because of oftentimes their European descent. I'm just tell you something that's un, unsubstantiated 
anti-Semitism is all that that is. Now let me qualify that by saying that according to Ezekiel chapter 37, the Jews which are in Jerusalem today, my friend, are dry bones. They're the same as the Jews which are in America or in Brazil or in Spain or in Russia or in uh, any of the nations of the world. In other words, they're the seed of Abraham, but they're not part of the promise today because they are in unbelief. And God is able to, remember of stones make children unto Abraham, and God is able, and at the time that they're going to become believers is when this 144,000 are going to be sealed. And so the question is, is God working in Israel today? Let me just give you a simple answer to that question, yes and no. In other words, God is working by preparing a distinct people, by preserving, I should say, a distinct people who, though in unbelief, have not lost their identity as the children of Abraham. One of the most supernatural evidences that there is a God is that in every single generation from Abraham forward, there have been attempts to stamp out the seed by unbelievers who hate them only because of God's promise, not necessarily because they're godly. There have been holocausts in every generation. And God has not allowed national Israel to be wiped out. Even unbelieving national Israel. Do you hear me this morning? See, the Israel that's part of the church, God's got track of all of them. You know, here's, here's a question. I won't have time to answer later. I'll, I'll just mention it to you now. Here's a question. The 12 tribes. Where are the 12 tribes and how are they identified? You know what my answer to that question is? I don't know, but God does very well. God knows who's who and what's what. And when He numbers the 12 tribes from every tribe, he, He's got to very well handle which tribe they come from. As late as the first century of the early church, individuals knew what tribe they were from. We know what tribe Joseph was from, don't we? We know what tribe Paul was from, don't we? Paul's tribe of Benjamin. Joseph was of uh, the tribe of Judah. Jesus was of the tribe of Judah. And you and I as adopted children of Jesus Christ have gotten the position of descendants. We've, we've got, we're Judah. We're from the tribe of Judah. You want to know what tribe you're from as a believer, and you can study Galatians and uh, Colossians, and you can see that very, very clearly in the Scripture for the adoption. And so, does God know who's who and what's what? Yes, He does. He's very aware of, and so you say, well, we've lost track. You know, but through the diaspora, the dispersing after 70 AD, uh, we've lost track of who all the Jews are. You have, but God hasn't. And this, this situation is well handled. And yet, national Israel has retained her identity very well, hasn't she? You can go to any community in the world and you can find God's people, the Jews. And I'm not talking about believing Israel. I'm talking about unbelieving Israel. They've retained their identity and their ethnicity. There's another nonsensical concept that I don't have time to cover. If you ask me about it later and I can remember what I'm talking about or what I, what I was mentioning, I'd be glad to share it with you. Okay? It's an everlasting covenant. The Davidic Covenant, let's just, just go over a couple of things. Here's some scriptures for you. By the way, the PowerPoint will probably, once it's edited a little bit, be on our YouTube, and you'll be able to access it there. But if you want to jot those scriptures down, uh, we can, you can go there. The, the, the Davidic Covenant was reaffirmed, it reaffirmed aspects of the covenants with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it had Messianic promises that David's seed would sit on the throne forever. And then we would actually see uh, some, some of these verses. Let's read them. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name, whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Who is that seed? Well, that's obviously the Christ, isn't it? It's the prophecy of Christ in Jeremiah 23, verses 5 and 6. Jesus Christ fulfills the prophecy about the seed of David. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. That is not David, that is Jesus. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even, what's those next two words? Forever. My friend, David's throne is not established forever at this moment, is it? It's not. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Okay, here's some more prophecy from Isaiah. There shall come forth out of the root, a, a rod, out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. I apologize, that, that's too small for you to read, isn't it? This is Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 10. I'm sorry, 
Uh, our, back, our, our, our backward is so technology. Now, our technology is so backward. Our, our screen isn't working, and we don't have Wi-Fi where I usually use it on my phone, and I could put the uh, projector in perspective. If you'd like to buy us a good 55-inch screen so we could set things up here, that would be fine. Till then, get some, uh, get some binoculars or something. All right. Um, and verse 10 of Isaiah chapter 11, And that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. It, to it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. Um, Christ fulfills these prophecies. The angel said unto her, this is in Luke 1, uh, that fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God, and behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord shall give unto him the throne of his father David. Again, this fulfillment of that, of that same prophecy. Uh, I'd like to talk about Israel in the present. What is Israel in the present? Israel presently is described in Ezekiel chapter 37 as dry bones. Dry bones without sinew, without flesh, and without life in them. And the question that God asked Ezekiel in chapter 37 of Ezekiel is can these dry bones live? And Ezekiel's question is, O oh Lord, thou knowest. You know, God. And then God actually says, prophesy to them. And he prophesies to them, and flesh comes on them, sinew comes on them, and, uh, but they're not living. And then, prophesy again, the wind comes in, the breath comes in, and they are given life. And Ezekiel is helped to understand that this is spiritually dead Israel who has the bones and even could have flesh or even could have sinew. And you know something, uh, what's going on in Jerusalem could be, could be flesh and sinew. Now, I'm not naive about, about God's chosen people according to the flesh. I know that per capita homosexuality is number one in, in Tel Aviv. The highest... Country, uh, the highest percentage of homosexual, uh, homosexuality and sexual perversion in the world is Tel Aviv. Uh, witchcraft, number one, in Tel Aviv. And you can talk about the wickedness that goes on with the unbelieving Israel today, and I would say I'm fully aware of that. They're not born again, they're not saved, they're acting like unbelievers. But God's got a plan for Israel. And there's going to come a time that unbelieving Israel at least 144,000 of them are going to believe. You know, were your parents saved? Your parents say, what if God rejected your parents? Wiped them out? Well, you'd never been born, you'd never been a believer. You know, ungodly parents can have godly offspring. Unbelieving parents can have believing offspring. And the notion that unbelieving Israel does not have children. Listen, don't we all know, don't we all have Jewish friends that have, that have been raised in Judaism and become believers in Jesus? Sure. I've never been in a church that doesn't have saved Jewish believers who now have their identity with Christ's church because it's the plan he's working today. God saves Jews, same as anybody else. Uh, but the notion that God hates national Israel or has no future plan for her, my friend, is hateful. It's hateful and it's unacceptable. It, it, it is uh, wicked to the nth degree. And uh, I don't have words for it, but God does. God will deal with it. God will judge it. You better watch out. You better watch out buying into a hatred toward Israel. Uh, Israel's presence, present, you'd have to read Ezekiel 37. You'd understand what Israel is today. Uh, God's laid cast her aside, but she has a future plan. You can read Romans 11 and see the fulfillment of that. Israel's future. Uh, this is Ezekiel chapter 47. And I want to read this, and I want you to pay attention to it. This is where my planting my sequoia tree is going to come in to good effect, okay? Thus saith the Lord God, this shall be the border whereby ye shall inherit the land according to the twelve tribes of Israel. Uh, Joseph shall have two portions, and ye shall inherit it as well as another uh, concerning the which I lifted up my hand to give it unto your fathers, and this land shall fall unto you for inheritance. I don't know if there's, I guess there's no way I can enlarge this. I'm really sorry about this. Uh, this shall be the border of Israel toward the north side from the great sea, the way of Hethlon, as men go to Zedad. Hamath, Barrow, Sibrium, which is the border of Damascus, and the border of Hamath, has, um, has our Hadakon, which is by the coast of Haran, and the uh, border from the sea shall be uh, Hazar Enan, the border of Damascus, and the, and the north northward, and the border of Hamath, and this the north side. And the east side you shall measure from Haran and from Damascus and from Gilead. Okay, we go through these measurements. Let's go down to verse 21. 
So shall ye divide this land unto you according to the tribes of Israel. Now, that's Ezekiel 47, Patty. And you know what I'm talking about, don't you? Individuals that say that Israel's already fully occupied the land. But the Ezekiel's in the captivity here. This is a future event from this point in time. And so, yeah, this is, uh, this is a passage of Scripture I don't hear uh, the anti-Semites referencing in the Scripture. They've torn it out of their Bibles or they just read past it very, very quickly. Verse 27, And it shall come to pass that ye shall divide it by lot for an inheritance unto you, and to the strangers that sojourn among you. Who might these strangers be? Who might they be? That's we ends, us ends, as they say up south. Uh, which shall beget children among you, and they shall be unto you as born in the country among the children of Israel. They shall have inheritance with you among the tribes of Israel. And it shall come to pass that in what tribe the so stranger sojourneth, there shall ye give him his inheritance, saith the Lord God. Don't you love the adoption? By the way, the adoption's always been. Man, I love to study Tamar. I love to study Rahab. I love to study Ruth. And look at how believers have always been welcomed into God's plan by belief. Okay, Israel's future. Uh, this is Daniel chapter 12. At that time shall Michael stand up. This is a parallel passage to our passage in Revelation 7. At uh, that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth as or for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust and the, of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Okay, so we're talking about this nation. What nation are we talking about in Daniel? What nation is Daniel asking God, referencing the 70-year captivity promise in Jeremiah about? National Israel, that's the nation. The nation is Israel. Israel, my friend, has a future. Do you hear me this morning? Israel has a future. And it is not Gentile spiritual Israel. That is, we're all Israel today, and uh, we're spiritual Israel today. Well, listen, you might be a Jew who is a believer in Jesus, and you may be born again and part of your, 12, uh, part of your, your inheritance in the 12 tribes, but most likely you're a Gentile. And you're part of this nation that sojourns, but the nation nationally is Israel. And it is a fulfillment of the promises to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and David. Uh, the 12 tribes of Israel are mentioned in these texts with the stranger sojourning among them. And here's the question. Is the kingdom of Israel actual seed of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and David? Will you go with me swiftly to Acts chapter 1? Acts chapter 1. And this is after Jesus Christ has risen and the church... Jesus has already uh, declared His church and said what He's going to do, but the church had not really begun to have the power of the Holy Ghost. And uh, it, was, it was in infant stages at this time. Luke writes this, the Acts, and he said, The former treatise of I made of Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach until the time in which He was taken up. After that, He, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom He had chosen, to whom also He showed Himself alive after His passion by many infallible proofs, uh, speaking, uh, or being seen in them 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Now, the kingdom of heaven, the king of, kingdom of God, and the kingdom of Israel, the kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God are synonymous terms, but the, king of Israel is a, the kingdom of Israel is a different term. Notice this in Acts chapter 1. Uh, being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you have heard of me. So wait at Jerusalem, for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days thence. The fullness of the power of the Holy Spirit of God, my friend, is the great privilege of the church to be able to have guaranteed power to preach the gospel and to reach the nations and to have this privilege of being ambassadors for Jesus is a grand privilege. Jesus has revealed His plan to the apostles who are going to be instruments in establishing this church that's going to have so much power. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? It's interesting, he spoke of them pertaining things of the Spirit of God, or the kingdom of God. And the, but the, the apostles were all what ethnicity? They're all Jewish. 
And Jesus is saying, the church, it's going to be great, it's going to be awesome, it's going to be all these things. And the apostles are like, what about Israel? <laughs> and Jesus said, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath placed in His power. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. In other words, Jesus said, those times, those seasons... Just like he said in Matthew 24, when he said, when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, see that you be not troubled, for the end is not yet. My friend, the next event on God's calendar is for the Lord Jesus to be in the sky and to call up His saints. That's why after Acts or after Revelation chapter 3, you never see reference to the church again in the Revelation. Because we are in a special period of time right now where God is working and the gospel is, is in fullness of power through Christ's church. But make no mistake, the church and the kingdom of Israel are distinct, separate institutions. Salvation is the same. It's by faith. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll conclude with that here in just a moment. Uh, but, and so, so this kingdom is going to be restored to Israel. Um, David is physically going to reign in the kingdom of Israel. Here are some unique things about, about Israel. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 30, if you're taking notes, for it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off thy neck and will burst thy bonds, and strangers shall no more serve themselves of him, uh, and, but they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up unto them. David physically is going to reign on a throne. Christ is going to sit on, uh, on David's throne as well. But David himself is going to be resurrected and part of this coming kingdom. David himself. Um, Ezekiel 37, David my servant shall be king over them. And they shall all have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. Now, individuals that mix the church and Israel like to speak in terms of allegories. They like to say everything is an illustration or an allegory. The Scripture does use allegories, and when it does so, it tells us this is an allegory. For instance, we're told that uh, Esau and Jacob, that Isaac and Ishmael are an allegory of belief and unbelief. We're told that. Now, did Isaac and Ishmael, were they actual people? Yes. Yeah, they weren't just an allegory, but they are a spiritual allegory for us that according to what Galatians is plainly teaching, that justification is by faith without the works of the law. Therefore, by the works of the law, there shall no flesh be justified. Justification is not by works. It's a spiritual thing. It's a spiritual desire. Okay, uh, and Ishmael is an example of the, of the, the son who was not the, the legitimate son, the illegitimate son. Presently, today, God is working on His church. That's where we come to a quick transition, the church. You say, Pastor, we're past time. You've preached forever today, and you need to be finished. I am going to just quit here pretty soon because I want to get further than this. But uh, I, I want to get through the, the, this uh, part on the church. The church is a present-day phenomenon. This is where Jesus established His church in Matthew 16. He said, Blessed art thou, Simon Berjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven, I say also unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock, knowing the Greek emu, or the rock of me, it's not, you know, you rock, the, the rock of you. It's a personal pronoun that Jesus uses there. Uh, this rock will I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Literally, the church storms the gates of hell and rescues sinners from them with the full power of God's Holy Spirit. I will give unto thee the king's keys of the kingdom of heaven. Being part of Christ's church is the means to eternal life today. You can't get saved through national Israel today. You can't go to a synagogue and convert, though the Jews were, are genetically the people uh, who were called God's chosen people. The God they worship is not Jesus. It's not Jehovah God. Uh, it's a different God that they're worshiping today. It's a made-up, man-made religion. But the people are going to have descendants who are going to worship the true God. and They're going to worship their Messiah. They're going to have David uh, for their king. And uh, that's the future. So the church is a present day phenomenon. The church today is spiritual Israel. I don't have a problem with people saying the church today is spiritual Israel. You can find that in Romans. But the difference is that we are grafted into the tree. We are not the, re the right branches. We're not the original branches. We're the branches which are contrary or wild by nature. But the promises to the church are not about land. The promises to Israel are. The promises to church, the church are not about seed. The promises to Israel 
are. Do you see the distinct difference between the two? Um, end of slideshow, click to exit. It's what my uh, thing says. Yeah, look at that. We, we got through that. All right. I am sorry. I warned you last week it would be like this. And uh, you know that I had just way too much to cover. But it's important. I'll be honest with you. It's so timely. It's so important. If you don't know why it's so important, I'm actually glad. I'm actually glad. If you just take what's taught today and know the truth about the church in Israel, you'll be further ahead than if you go off this way and that way willy-nilly following all kinds of wild, uneducated teachers. You need to know the Word of God. And it's important. All right. From our text today, uh, you have the outline from what we're preaching today. And uh, you could, I'm just going to, just, just to read, uh, read some of it in conclusion today. Um, we can very simply infer, I'm down at point A, under point one, God will turn unbelieving Israel to him. We can infer from the fact that the king of Israel will be David and Christ, and the geographical location is the promised land, that the future reign of Christ will be Jewish. Is that, is that logical? Does that follow? I think so, don't you? Okay. Uh, number two, we could conclude from our from our text that Israel today is in unbelief. Right? National Israel today is in unbelief. And unbelievers have never been saved by their ethnicity. Uh, individuals that teach the false teaching about the, the church try to claim, and by the way, there's some validity. If you follow TBN and you follow the John Hagees and that sort of folks that really make a lot out of national Israel, and I'm not bashing today, I'm just saying uh, they... they they try to claim that God is blessing Israel today. And that actually couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, God's people are under God's curse. They're divorced right now from Him. Blessed people are very, very different than what you see from national Israel today. National Israel today is being preserved because God has a future plan for them. And God's preservation, to a degree, is blessing. But if you're trying to say, Pastor Price, you're saying God is, God's blessing is on national Israel today. No, no, my friend, that's not what blessing looks like. Blessing's a lot better when it comes from God than that. Uh, Israel today is unbelief, and unbelievers have never been saved by their ethnicity, and there are some scriptures you could reference for that. Oh, look, the back of the, my page is actually, uh, you don't have to flip it upside down to read it. Uh, God's future plan for Israel will be, uh, first of all, saved Israelites are part of the church today. Does that make sense? Today, uh, saved Israelites are part of the church. Can Jews be saved? Yes, and they'll be part of God's plan today. And, and are many saved? Probably more than we realize because we've actually, in the church, we've lost our identity as far as Jew, being Jewish goes. Isn't it so? When you identify with Jesus, that's your identity. Now, you're you know, adopted in, uh, but uh, you lose that Israel identity in the church. By the way, I reject Messianic, uh, the, the whole Messianic movement. I, I, and again, it's it sound like I'm just angry and against everything. I'm not at all. But the false doctrines really cause a lot of dangerous problems. The Messianic synagogue system of worship patterns itself after Judaism, which is not what God established for national Israel. They're not worshiping in a temple either. They're not offering sacrifices. They don't have priests. They're just doing the pagan things that have been added by the rabbis and, and uh, that have been in, given instead of the truth that, Christ, that God established with national Israel. Uh, last point, salvation has always been by faith. We need to get here today, don't we? Salvation is, has been, and always will be by faith. Genesis 15 and verse 6, Abraham believed God, and his faith was counted to him for righteousness. How was Abraham saved? Because God elected him and gave him a promise? No, Abraham was saved because he believed God. That's what the Bible says. Romans 4, 3, same thing. Romans 4, 7, Galatians 3, 6, James 2, 23. Hebrews 11 gives an illustration of everyone who's a pattern of faith uh, for us. And uh, then the last thing I want to point out today, and this is uh, some good people that I know that would teach, that if you don't get saved in the church age, it'll be too late. And friend, that's not true either because we see 144,000 people in our text today uh, that have the seal of God on their foreheads because they become believers in Jesus Christ. What do we draw by way of conclusion then today? Well, a lot of things actually, but the thing that we ultimately draw really reflects more on God than it does on the church or Israel, doesn't it? I love that song we sang earlier. Do you remember, do you remember that song which is a glorious church without spot or wrinkle? You ever been in a church that seemed like that? I, I missed that experience a little bit. But uh, God's not naive about His church, is He? He knows exactly what we are. He knows our weaknesses. But He knows what we can be by His grace. And ultimately, God is going to present Himself to us, a glory, to Himself, a glorious church, 
without spot or wrinkle. The means to that, first of all, is through the blood of Jesus Christ. You're the you know, you, you, you might claim your nationality and say, I'm special in the eyes of God. You're special because Jesus died for you. Not because of what you're born as. You're born a sinner. And that makes you in special need of the death of Jesus Christ in your place. Jesus died and took our judgment. And my friend, what a wonderful thing that God loved us enough to sacrifice His perfect, sinless Son for us. God has a future plan. Right now, God is working in the church, and it has the gospel. We are ambassadors for Christ in this church, and we have a purpose. We're going to be part of this future plan God has, either as a Jew or as a, uh, who's a believer or as a Gentile who sojourns in the land. We're going to get to see all this unfold. At the end of the chapter, in chapter 7, you saw the saints following after the Lord Jesus, having washed their robes in, in their robes that were white. We saw previously they were washed in the blood of the Lamb. That's us. And I'm looking forward to that day. But the next event on God's calendar is for Jesus Christ to be in the sky and to call us up as saints. And friend, we need to be living in light of His coming. You know what Mark concluded when Jesus shared the answer to those questions? He said, what I say unto you all, I, unto you, I say unto you all, watch. He said, watch therefore, for you know not what hour the Son of Man cometh. And Jesus is coming, my friend. He's real. And uh, this message today... It doesn't need to be a debate about, you know, Israel or the church. or you know It's not intellectual, my friend. It's actual. We're supposed to preach the gospel in light of what we've seen. We need to have our theology straight or we can preach another gospel. And that's what it becomes. We don't want to preach a gospel, which is another. I hope that's a help to you. I'm, not, I'm just going to conclude the service right there today and leave you in stunned silence <laughs> saying, will he ever be done? Yes, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to go to the Word today. And Lord, it's, it's rich. There's so much in it. And I feel so inadequate as a preacher to try to share everything that can be shared, especially with limitations of time. And God, I pray that, that you just be gracious to us in this and increase our understanding and help us to believe the truth of your Word. We ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed.